Yeah, so this is a really good question about what to do with group norms. And because this is just one semester of me doing this and I'm doing it again this current semester of, fall, of summer, um, I've done a lot of discussing in class what, I, what I'm hoping that the groups will be looking like and what I'm hoping that the conversations will be looking like. But I haven't been monitoring it. And there is an idea from a couple students this summer, I'd like to follow up and do some focus groups with them about collecting possibly data on the, the group portion of the test itself to see if students, to see how much people feel like each other is contributing. I, I'm just, I'm really hesitant about that. I just think that's really biased data. I mean, everything is biased in, in some sense, but I haven't figured out quite what to do with that. I guess that's the bottom line. So I've just done some conversations and hope that it's worked out and waiting for, you know, I keep checking in with students also to see if things are not going well. I wanted to follow up on the question. I was wondering if you know about the complex instruction modes, especially the way that group norms are, are created uh, within the K-8 space. And I think that's yeah. So luckily I haven't gotten any of those comments since I made sure that we have 15 minutes of solo time. I haven't gotten any follow-up comments that the groups are not working. The kinds of comments I'm getting now that, are, that could be classified as negative are things like, oh, the students convinced me that I was wrong when I was the right one, <laughs> you know, on this problem. Um, I have read a little bit, but not enough probably. And remember that this was just me taking on a challenge from Rochelle saying, okay, I'm gonna try something drastically new. I didn't really know how it would go. So I think at this point I need to to do some more research to refine it. Yeah. Um, beyond assessment, do you have any uh, other plans to take on the challenge to read deeper and understand better for classes? Well, I don't have any current plans to take on to rehumanize my classroom. That doesn't mean that's not going to happen. Um, do you have a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear it if so. Pardon me. <laughs> With the positive results that you got, I'm interested in knowing what plans you have to share this information with your colleagues and perhaps institutionalize the method to the extent that they would be acceptable to it. Because it, it, it as the theme of, of our workshop is, it's about equity. You know, providing students a way right. to uh, learn mathematics and enjoy it. Yes. So the question really is about, is there a plan to institutionalize this or to share with other colleagues so that other people can implement this or implement something like it or at least ponder <laughs> possibilities? Um, this is my first attempt, I guess. So I would like to do more. It, it, I've been in contact with Rochelle Gutierrez and it's likely that we'll write a paper together based on this idea but uh, that may be a ways off. I think actually for our institution, at least at the University of Utah, my instinct is that we need a lot more data to follow the students a little bit further before we could make some changes, but I am sharing it locally with everyone I can think of in our department to see if other people would like to take it on, and we have five grad students here, four grad students here who are teaching, so it's, the likelihood that it will spread in our department is pretty high. I just don't, it's not institutionalized at this point. Yeah. Um, I, I really like this idea. I was just wondering like if the content of your exam, have changed, like the format of the questions have changed because you're adding a uh, random component to it. Like do you feel like the questions have like become more rigorous like that this is so that it facilitates group discussion or like has the content basically kind of stayed the same? So in this first experimentation in the spring, I tried to keep the content mostly the same because I want the numbers to be comparable to some degree. Um, however, what I did on the group portion was I tried to put the problems on the group portion that were statistically the hardest on previous exams for Calc 2 students, right? So if we're doing a test on integration techniques, students typically will stumble with the triangle, drawing the triangle and doing a trig substitution. Um, partial fraction decomposition is another one that students typically have a hard time with. So I would put a, let's say I put a partial fraction decomposition integration technique problem on the group portion, then I would take the liberty to make it maybe slightly harder 
than a past exam so that it gave them more incentive to be able to talk in groups. But I suspect that what's going to happen is that I'll end up asking a lot more open-ended questions and conceptual questions on the group portion. That kind of happened this summer, uh, not intentionally, but I think it is this, as you said, it's kind of a natural instinct with groups to, be able to ask them questions that really will do well with a group, right? Where you really need your group mate to be able to discuss and work through it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how about high, medium, low scores? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what happened with the midterms was really for midterm one and midterm two, I really did just pick random groups. Right, and maybe for midterm two, by then I knew about um, some concerns with, with female students or non gender non-conforming students being with two men, and so I made sure that didn't happen. But because I had started the semester creating random groups, I never really told them that it changed, and no one asked me, <laughs> so I don't know if they noticed. <laughs> it never came up, and so I just figured, well, it's fine. They don't really need to know exactly how I created the groups. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Either one. <laughs> um, did you have students, when they were working in groups, did they submit one exam? Did no. They how did that go? Or did, they, and then did you grade each individual student's work if you didn't? Everybody submitted their own exam. So there were no, there was no group submission. Um, I, I'm personally opposed to this idea of having a group submission. So I'm sure that this could work also. It's just not my personal preference. Um, anyway, so I actually like the idea that students can debate something. You and I can have two different conclusions and I'm gonna write up my own work and you're gonna write up your own work, and so our answers may disagree. What tends to happen in the group portions is they do agree at some point, but I think this is an interesting challenge as well, right? There's a self-efficacy thing that's going on there, because if, if it turns out that you're right and I'm wrong, and I was just more uh, boisterous in my, in my convincing of you, and then you decided that I was right and went against your own thinking, then now I think there's a, a reasonable learning in that process of you saying, okay, well, I, I can believe myself more. Next time, I'm not gonna let the other person talk me out of it. I'm gonna write down what I wanna write down. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is a great question. For some people, it is causing them to work in groups outside of class. And that is specific, so by the final exam, especially students were asking, can you please give us the groups at least two weeks ahead of time so we can work together? And by then, there was just so much community in the classroom that they mostly knew each other, so they would know, oh, I'm with so-and-so and so-and-so, and I'm gonna get together with them outside of class. It certainly didn't happen for most of the groups, I think. Um, so maybe I would say up to half, but I have not collected survey data on that, although that is a good idea. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time.
Right. Get it on my ear. Ah, okay. That's, there's some sound going there. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'll just use this approach. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon. Uh, my, I am Jerunda Hughes, and my colleague uh, Dina Khalil and I collaborated on this project. It's actually um, a research project. And just as Kelly talked about uh, humanizing mathematics, uh, I was thinking to myself, this really is about humanizing the people who try to learn mathematics. We're going to talk about uh, a group, two, actually two groups of African American students. Uh, one group is a group of rising freshmen. And what we wanted to know is rather than using the regression models and using the uh, results from the survey questions that we wrote on our survey, we wanted to hear what their experiences were in their own voices. Uh, this allowed them to tell us some, many things that perhaps uh, the regression models uh, didn't account for. Um, and, this, and I need to tell you another thing about this group of, of rising freshmen that we're going to be talking about. These were a group of students who had been con conditionally admitted to the university because of how they had performed on mathematics exam. And so they came to a uh, summer uh, bridge program, and they were taking developmental mathematics. And uh, I happened to be one of the instructors, and I was personally interested in what were their experiences in high school that put them in this position, because they were coming into a very high-level business program. And it was an opportunity for them to be admitted into the program. The other group that I'm going to tell you about <clears throat> is a group of African American students who were coming to Howard University. But these students had a very different type of experience. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying that is um, sometimes we paint broad pictures about students, students of color, uh, about their experiences in high school. At, Ex their experiences when they come into our mathematics classes. But these were st students who were in an elementary education program, some of whom had taken e up to calculus in, in, high, in high school. So two different types of students, all African Americans. And what I want to share with you is the experiences that they had that explain uh, their performance in the different courses that they took eventually, but also I wanted to let you know that they had different experiences in, in high school. And uh, Dina and I had the opportunity to share some of this at a psychology and mathematics uh, conference some time ago. And so there'll be some uh, psychological uh, concepts that I'll be sharing with you. Okay, so the purpose of the study. The purpose of the study was to identify the factors that influence the mathematics learning and achievement of two groups of African American undergraduate freshmen who attended a historically black university by analyzing their self reported narratives and identifying the common themes which focused on the high school mathematical experiences. Additionally, we wanted to compare the early mathematical experiences of the two groups of undergraduate freshmen with those of successful African American scientists, mathematicians, and engineers, as reported in the literature. So the comparison was not only between the two groups. We also searched the literature, and we found what is it about the experience of successful African American STEM professionals, and how does this compare? to the experiences of these students. Okay, What's the significance of the study? Well, African Americans are reported to be 
perennially underrepresented in fields related to science, engineering, technology, and mathematics in the United States. The achievement gap between African Americans and other racial ethnic groups in math continues to exist even after years of educational reform and huge financial resources that have been expended. And this puzzles me. This puzzles me. Why does this continue to exist when we know what we can do to erase the gaps and provide equitable opportunities, implement them? Is it a matter of will? Or is it something else? Now, there's a theoretical, a conceptual, psychological framework that we um, applied to this study. And it's called the Braffenbrenner's Ecological System. And what you see are a series of concentric circles. And what it does is it help us understand how the systems in which a child lives determines, and how these systems interact with each other, determines how a student um, will develop cognitively, in some cases physically, and of course academically. And I just want to describe uh, some of those for you. As you can see, the most immediate environment uh, around the child is called the microsystem. And who's involved in the microsystem of the child? Well, as you can imagine, it would be the parents, it would be caretakers, and guess what? It's the school, all right? So the school plays a very important part where the child is educated. So that includes the teachers, the teachers as well. And what the mission of the school uh, is, or the mission of the uh, system, and how that system affects the child. Now, Bryson Breno says that these systems, especially that microsystem, is reciprocal. It's bidirectional. Uh, the child's relationship with the parents, as well as how the parents interact with the child, or the school for that matter, plays an important role. And then there's the, and you know I have, well, these are the systems and on different um, slides I have uh, explained them. And here they are. Nope. OK, here they are. Here are the definitions. The microsystem contains the immediate environment that the child is part of, the family, the home, the school, groups. The mesosystem is comprised of connections and linkages between the child's immediate environment, that is, connections between the parents, for instance, and the school. And so it raised, might raise the question, how inviting are parents in a school situation? Are they welcome? Do the parents have an opportunity to come parent to parent-teacher uh, conferences? And what accommodations, for instance, does the school make for parents who may have two or three jobs? Uh, I've been in school systems where, if you look at parental involvement and parents involved in the schools, Parents are all over the schools because they have the economic wherewithal within the family for either the father or the mother to have regular pres presence in the school. But in some schools, there are parents who have two or three jobs. Right? So the question is, what is the situation for the child? And more importantly, what effect does this interaction between the parents and the school, for example, have on the development of the child, both um, academically uh, and cognitively. There's, then there's the exorcism. And it contains the connections and processes in the two settings, for example, in the parent's workplace. Does the parent have a job? Does the parent have um, enough income to have a living wage? So even though uh, the, uh, the connections and processes and the exorcism uh, do not contain the child directly. Still, what happens in that space uh, affects the child. And I think I have another example of that, too. It says, 
it describes the different parts of the child's uh, microsystem that work together for the sake of the child. And as I said, one has to do with employment uh, or not, and another may have to do with the workspace. Suppose the parent does have a job. Does that job require the parent to work so much that the, child, that the parent is not spending enough time with the child? So all of these interactions affect the child. And then there's the microsystem. And this is an overreaching one. It, in, it involves the culture, the subculture, belief systems, bodies of knowledge. It may even involve whether or not the child has a right to an education. It has to do with educational policies. Uh, again, and I, I will show you in some of the examples on, on the other sides, how all of these systems, either directly or indirectly, involve, uh, affect the development of the child. Okay. Now, another theoretical framework that we use had to do with the narrative uh, psychology. And this is a subfield in psychology which focuses on the storied nature of human conduct, specifically how human beings deal with the experiences that they have by constructing stories and listening to the stories of others. This is one reason why in this particular study, instead of doing a survey, I asked them to write Dear Dr. Hughes letters. This provided an opportunity for them to send me a personal letter and uh, express their experiences in their own words. And then there, there's Walbach's model of educational productivity, and this comes out of uh, the field of economics. And it examines the interaction of about nine factors affecting success in schools and learning. And, they <coughs> and that when these things are optimized, it increases affect, behavioral and cognitive learning, and the nine factors fall into those three categories, student aptitude, instruction, and psychological environment, in the physical environment and the psychological environment. Now, I, in reading the literature, I found that in many cases, sometimes these factors, these nine factors, only explain maybe about 80% of the variance in student achievement. So the question is, what explains that other variance? And so I thought it might be a good idea to ask the students in their own voices. Now, methodology. The sample consisted of two groups of freshman students selected purposefully who attended a private historically black university in the mid-Atlantic region of the United States. I called them cohort one and cohort two. Cohort one consisted of a diverse group of 28 African-American freshmen who were conditionally submitted to a business program at the university. And this was some time ago. Now, notice that there are, these 28 students came from 19 different states. I thought that was very interesting because I wanted to see, did I see the same themes from students from different states? In other words, were their experiences pervasive? It didn't matter whether you came from the East Coast, the West Coast, the South or the North, were these African American students experiencing the same things in their mathematical school experiences? And by the way, you see, you see I have that No Child Left Behind. The reason why I put that image there is because when was No Child Left Behind? passed by Congress. Do you remember? 2002. So, so these students had been in, in, under this educational policy for quite a while. And it was a policy that, the, and by the way, it was part of the macro system, that part of the system where uh, government, governmental policies are involved, and that affect the students. Um, uh, I wouldn't say indirectly, but very directly because of what happens in schools. And of course, schools are right there in that microsystem, along with parents and, and that kind of thing. So these were students who had been part of this system for a while. Okay. 
Oh. The other one, <laughs> cohort two, consisted of a group of 12 African American freshmen who were aspiring to be elementary school teachers and were who were enrolled in an introductory education uh, course. Okay? And this was six years after Common Core. Again, it was an educational policy that had affected, because you know, with the Common Core standards, teachers had to become familiar with those standards and they had to implement them. And how many years after they were implemented were students tested? And it wasn't a formative assessment. It was an accountability assessment. So a lot of high stakes decisions were associated with student performance on these assessments. And so these students were conditionally admitted to the teacher education program pending their satisfactory performance on Praxis I, which was designed to measure their reading, writing, and mathematical skills. So again, you have two sets of students who have been conditionally admitted based on, we dig deep enough, their performance on exams, many of them mathematics. So I was very, very interested in what were your mathematical experiences prior to coming? Okay, oh, should go back. Okay, so the research design is called phenomenography. And a phenomenogra phonographic approach usually involves contextual groups of people Data collection involves individual descriptions of experiences or understanding, and analysis is whole group with the aim of identifying possible connections of the phenomenon under study. And that had to do with what were their experiences. And so there were two research questions. What factors do African American undergraduates, freshmen, perceive to be relevant to their mathematics learning experience and achievement? And are these factors consistent across diverse groups of African Americans across different points in time? Okay. Data analysis. We use contextual analysis for each student and cross-student analysis across the cohorts were conducted. Data were coded inductively by using very emerging patterns and themes. And they co then coded in deductively by comparing the interactions, motivations, attitudes, opportunities, and challenges that shape the mathematical experience of these students. Patterns and themes from the study that involve early mathematical experience of successful African American scientists and mathematicians were then compared to the themes that we found from the two groups. And what do we find? Mm -hmm. Oh, also, Wahlberg's model of educational productivity, which includes nine factors, and by the way, the nine factors are included there. You can see that student aptitude was about ability of prior achievement, development, motivation of self-construct, concept. Instruction had to do with the quantity of time students engaged in learning and the quality of the edu uh, instructional experience. And then the psychological environment had to do with the home, the classroom peer group, the peer group external to school, that is their peers, and the use of uh, out of school time. Okay, so what were the findings? Well, for cohort one, the two factors mentioned most often were the quality of instructional experiences and students' motivation of self-concept about mathematics. Now, these two factors may not be mutually exclusive. In other words, they might explain some of the same variants. Because for many of the African American students, feelings of self-concept or motivation to be successful in math were shaped by 